Let's talk about FIN 790. I posted the syllabus for my summer seminar. Of course, it's last summer, so it's not going to change a whole lot. And it's an opportunity to pick up a seminar in the summertime online, which is pretty good if you're out doing some sort of internship. You don't have to worry about showing up for class and all that kind of crap. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about it. You're going to do readings in eight different areas, like information asymmetry, which is where I know something that you don't, or vice versa. Agency problem, corporate governance, all sorts of fun stuff. And over each one of those, there's a there's a reading that goes with each of them. And over each of them, you're going to have a 10 question homework assignment. So basically, one of those a week. And then, oh, actually, actually it's got to be more than one a week. Anyway, so but it's, it's not a, a big problem. I've had lots of students do it with no issues. Um, then you're going to propose an area that you'd like to do a literature review over and uh, maybe propose some research extensions over it. Like you say, oh, I noticed nobody's looked into the impact of information asymmetry on Airbnb or something like that. And you're gonna send that proposal to me. I'll let you know whether it is too narrow, too broad, and I'll give you some suggestions on how to adjust your focus or your scope to get the right length of paper. I can't remember exactly how long the paper is I require from you, but it is not long. It is not long. And then you do a presentation over the paper, and uh, we do that through pitch vantage. And so basically, we don't have to interact at all in class. You can work at your own pace. It's, uh, it's worked out really well for people. I tend to get much better teaching evaluations for 790 than I do for 780. I also tend to uh, get fewer complaints from 790 than I do from 780. But that could be because the people who absolutely hate me from 780 don't take 790. So there could be selection <laughs> bias. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm trying to throw that out there. If you have questions about that, please just let me know. Any questions before we get rolling here? Okay, so today we're going to talk about risk, cost of capital, and capital budgeting. So we know that risk and return have to go together. But previously, when we're working these problems, now it looks like, or we were just have been handed this rate as if it came down from the gods of finance. Do you think the gods of finance actually exist? No. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. There are no gods of finance. Now, what we have, we have markets, and markets are pretty good at putting prices on risk. In other words, a required return on risk. So we're going to have to come up with those numbers for ourselves, and we're going to use the markets to do that. And so what we're going to do in this lesson is to figure out how to determine that correct rate of return based on the risk of the investment. Any questions so far? Okay, now let's, let's just, just for a second here, let's think about when we valued stocks, we looked at the present value of all the future dividends. When we valued bonds, we looked at the present value of all the coupons and what? Same. The face value, the yeah. face value, right? So both of those things, we were finding the present value of the future cash flows. And when we look at other things like factories and machines, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to find the present value of those future cash flows to determine the value of those things. But once again, we need to have that required risk of return in order to be able to require rate for the risk in order to be able to do that. So. Let's assume that a firm is all equity, meaning it has no debt. All we would need to do then to figure out the firm's cost of capital is to look at the cost of its equity capital. Now, you can have a firm with zero debt. Can you have a firm with zero equity? No, somebody's got to own something, right? Okay, so a lot of people think that equity is free. Well, hey, I'll just go out and issue some stock. It doesn't cost me anything as long as I don't pay dividends. Not true. Everybody has an expected return when they invest. Whether that return is going to be through dividends or capital gains, everybody has an expected return. 
And so equity still has a cost. And we have two ways that we can determine that cost of equity. And we've talked about them both before. We've got the capital asset pricing model, or what does SML stand for? Security market line. And then we also have the dividend discount model, which we talked about in chapter six. So let's look at the security market line. Hopefully you guys remember it. By the way, do you think you're gonna need this on your note sheet for the next exam? Yep. Uh, we've got the expected return on the stock is equal to the risk-free rate plus the beta of the stock multiplied by, what do we call that thing in the square brackets? Market risk, market risk premium, which is just the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. So that's what we've got to have in order to be able to do the security market line. We're going to have to have an estimate of the risk-free rate. Does anyone remember what we use as our stand-in for the risk-free rate, Mr. Mers. Uh, three-month treasury bill. Yeah, three-month treasury bill, right. Three-month treasury bill. And so that's what we're gonna use is our estimate of the risk-free rate. And then we've gotta have our estimate of the market risk premium. We already had the estimate of the risk-free rate, so all we have to have is an uh, estimate of the, or, or expected return for the market. What are we gonna use as our stand-in for the market? Yeah, the S&P 500, the S&P 500. So I can get historical data for the risk-free rate, I can get historical data for the S&P 500, and just make sure they're in the same time frame, and then that tells me those things. And then I need an estimate of the securities data. So we already talked about the three-month treasury bill. It turns out there's actually a one-month treasury bill and it would actually be better because it doesn't contain as much interest rate risk because it's shorter time to maturity. But the problem is it just doesn't trade that much. There's not that much interest in it. And so we don't have the really good data on it like we do for the three months. So that's why we always say use the three month. Now, if I only give you the one month and there is no other, what should you do? Yeah, use whatever treasury bill yield I give to you. I've had so many students look at these problems and they're like, you didn't give me the risk-free rate. And I say, well, what piece of information did I give you that you're not knowing what to do with? Well, like, well, this three month treasury bill, boop, there you go, that's it. That's your risk-free rate. Now we talked about the S&P 500. But there's an issue. We talked about using historical data. But the question is, how far to go back? You guys took a statistics class, undoubtedly. Do statisticians like bigger sample sizes or smaller sample sizes? Yeah, they, they say they want bigger sample sizes. And they're gonna to say to us that we should go all the way back to 1926 because that's where we started having this information on the returns on the S&P. 500. But there's a problem. The returns on the S&P 500 represent the returns basically on the American economy. Do you think the American economy has changed any since 1926? Oh yeah. 1926 we were largely agricultural. I've talked to my grandfather, he's dead now, but he told me uh, basically about when he was a boy, most of the, of the work that was being done was farm work and our cities were far far smaller, our rural population was far larger. Now move forward to World War II. What happens? Yeah, we become more industrial. Now we've always had industry, but we basically were forced to quickly expand our industrial base overnight. Now at the same time, uh, we're gonna use that industrial base to build tractors and things to reduce the labor on the farm. And so now we're moved to a more industrial economy. And that plays out up through about the 1970s. And then we get into the 1980s and we entered what we call a service economy where most of us are doing stuff for other people instead of making stuff. Kind of like I'm doing stuff for you today in exchange for money. That's the service economy, right? And then we've moved forward to today. What do we think, what kind of economy do we have today? Starts with an I, the information economy. 
So we've, we've gone through these different phases, and my question to you is, do you think that each one of those different types of economies would have identically the same impact on S&P 500? I think the answer is no. And so it doesn't make sense to go all the way back to the beginning. And so let's say, let's just look at from the year 2000 forward. Now we're looking at, let's say 2003, just to make the numbers crisp. Uh, so we're looking at 20 years worth of data there. And you say, well, you know, that sounds good. And not that much has changed since 2003, perhaps. Um, but there's a problem in there. We have what's in there that might not be normal. Yeah, so we had first, we had the housing crisis, 2008, 2009, and then what? COVID. Yeah, we had COVID, and now, uh, I don't know what's going on, but we may have bank crises. We've got inflation. So my point to you is this, if you're looking for a, a normal time period in history, good luck, right? And so people want to, drop out those events. So say, well, we'll count everything but COVID. We won't count the recession. We won't count this. We won't count that. And then they're finding what is the expected for normal times. Well, how often do we actually have normal times? So we, we, have, we can't just drop these things, but we need to recognize that they do impact our estimates. And so the question is, how far back do you go? If you go back only a shorter amount of time, you have a fresher estimate, but it's done with a lower uh, sample size, so it's perhaps not as accurate statistically. But if you use a longer time period, then you run the risk of that estimate being stale. So what would I do? I would probably say, well, let's, let's look at two years, five years, 10 years. Let's look at all of those and see how much of an impact it really has. We could do some sensitivity analysis there. Will I be asking you to do that on an exam? No. Of course not. Of course not. Now, let's talk about estimating beta. I don't even think I actually really showed you this in class, but we can use Excel to do linear regression to find the beta. And that is how we can do that. It's over a historical time frame. But once again, uh, our choice is, uh, do you, oh, by the way, do you think beta stays the same for companies over time? No. The company changes just like the U.S. economy changes. So beta, you could just use the most recent beta for over the last year to get your freshest estimate. But once again, you're going to have a low sample size. And so it's not going to be as statistically accurate. And so once again, we've got one of those trade-offs. Okay, now, something, oh, we're gonna to get to this one in a second. Let's talk about time varying beta. Speaking of companies changing over time, let's roll back to 1993 to 1997. By the way, 1993, uh, it's my senior year of college. I've got, uh, I've been using DOS. You guys don't even know what DOS is, probably a disk operating system from uh, Microsoft. It's what we did before Windows. You had to type in everything. You had to type in prompts to copy files and all that kind of stuff. There was no clicking and dragging, none of that. So then in 1993, for the first time, I see Windows. And at that time, it was a pretty out there kind of thing. And Microsoft was basically considered to be a high tech firm because this was high tech stuff. And we can look at the beta there of 1.28 and that beta is greater than the beta on the market, which we would expect from a tech firm. And then we roll forward in the 98 to 2002. I would best characterize this time frame as the dot-com bubble, the dot-com bubble. And at that time, anything that was remotely related to computers just got blown out of proportion. So it makes total sense that the beta on it would be higher during that time frame. By the time we get through the dot-com bubble, 2003 to 2007, and in fact going on to 2012, uh, now Microsoft is more like a utility. Utility like an electric company where you basically pay your bill every month. Uh, so basically by this time down here on the bottom, everybody's using Microsoft Windows, everybody's using Microsoft Office, 
And so basically the cash flows at, uh, at Microsoft are far less risky. There's far less systematic risk to them. And so we can see the beta changes over time. Now, more importantly, what, I sh what I'm gonna show you here is that these are basically linear regressions. The blue lines are linear regressions using the data points, which are the black dots. Let's talk about how well those blue lines fit the black dots. If you look at 2008, 2012, it's fairly good. And you might say that 1998 to 2002 is fairly good. But what about the two over here on the left? Do those look like good fits to you? It's kind of iffy. In fact, uh, how many of you know what a shotgun is? What's a shotgun? How many, how many projectiles does a shotgun shoot? Oh, that's a rifle. Oh, you're unless you think of a slug gun. <laughs> Okay, shotgun, anyone else know about that? Two? Okay, so it really depends on what kind of shells you're using. You guys ever heard the term double-op buck? Double-op buck shot is what you use for like home defense. And it's got nine 34 caliber balls in a 12 gauge shell. And so when you shoot those, you're gonna end up with how many holes? Probably nine, unless one falls out of the one end, which is highly unlikely. And when you use a, a smaller shot, like you might use to bring down a duck or a quail or a rabbit, then you end up with even more of those little balls in the shell. My point to you is this: I could take my 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 good uh, my grandfather's 12 gauge shotgun out, and I could make patterns that look like 93 to 97, and 2003 to 2007. Would a linear regression of data points like that have any meaning at all? No. So you've got to be careful putting too much emphasis on or putting too much faith in the numbers that we come up with through linear regression because after all, they're just a swag. What does swag stand for? Sign to the blood. Something gets. Sign to the you don't want to say that? No, no, we discussed before. This isn't cursing because we're talking of an ass is a wild donkey. Okay, yeah, so it's time to ask ass. The word ass is actually in the Bible. Did you know that? Okay, yeah, there you go. That makes it perfectly fine, right? Okay, as long as we're talking about donkeys. Okay. Back to this. Back to the story. Um, all of you got to remember that these numbers are just estimates. In fact, everything we do are estimates. So now, your book makes this argument. Your book says, well, you know, we could have our cake and eat it too. We could, instead of going back for 10 years worth of beta for our firm and getting a stale estimate of beta, we could find nine other firms doing exactly the same thing that we're doing and just do one year estimates for them and just come up with the average beta for all those firms. And that would give us the same sample size plus a fresh estimate. It just sounds like a really great, compelling argument. But I'm gonna show you the problem with that. Here we have the software industry and we've got different betas for different companies in the software industry. And we're gonna go through here, and we're gonna talk about these companies one at a time. And assume that our company is a pure software company. We're looking for a beta that is purely for software. How about Microsoft? Is Microsoft a pure software company? No, why not, Mr. Merce? They make the Surface Pro and stuff. Okay, they make Surface Pro. I'm gonna ask Mr. Bernstein. What else does Microsoft make? Software. <laughs> okay, software, yes. Uh, let's see. I remember your first name, uh, Bert, uh, Briar, Mr. Briar. What? Not too sure. You're not too sure. Nobody in here plays video games? I still yeah. consider that software. Yeah, the Xbox? Yeah, the programming. The programming is software, but the Xbox itself is? Hardware. Hardware. Yeah, and so we've got a mixture here. We've got a mixture of software and hardware at Microsoft. And strangely enough, you guys might not realize this, but if you own a late model Ford, 
and you've got the MySync touch blah 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 system, that's also Microsoft. And so Microsoft's into a lot of things that are may or may not be software. So we got to scratch them off the list. Now, let's look at Apple. What does Apple make? Phones. Phones, computers, all sorts of stuff. Now, do they also make software? Absolutely they do. This thing's got all sorts of software in it that was made by Apple. But are they a pure software company? Absolutely not. So scratch them off the list. Then we've got automatic data processing or ADP. How many of you have ever worked a job where on your paycheck or your paycheck stub, you saw somewhere on an ADP? So was it a, like a small to medium sized business? This is a pretty good one. Okay, which can you share the name? It was worldwide technology. It was worldwide technology. Boy, that sounds big, worldwide. <laughs> okay, so typically the companies that use ADP are small to medium enterprises. And here's what ADP does. ADP has developed this web portal, which so far sounds software. They've developed a web portal where you can go and you put in the information about your employees and like the number of dependents and all that kind of stuff that you need to do the things you need to do with employees, like manage their benefits, taxes, pay, everything. So it's payroll. Basically, we're doing payroll here. So we're outsourcing our payroll to ADP. And what we'll do is for every pay period, you'll have the person at your facility go in and enter in the number of hours that each person worked. Or in the case of salaried employees, yeah, they showed up. And so then you end up with uh, the ADP has all this data and they use it to calculate all these different things that need to be withheld and to figure out how much that needs to be paid to the employee. Now, so far, that sounds like it's majority software, maybe a little bit business services, but here's the big thing. ADP also takes care of, uh, and they have access to your banking account, and so what they do is they send the correct amounts of money to the state of Missouri, to the federal government, to the insurance company for the health premiums that the, comes out of the employee's check, retirement, all that kind of stuff. They send all that stuff to the right place and then they do an ACH or an automated clearinghouse transaction to send uh, the remainder amount of money to the employee. Or they can send them a check. So that's what ADP does. Now, my question to you is, is ADP a pure software company? No, no, it's more. We would think of it better as being a business services company. So I wouldn't even put it on this list. And while we're on the topic of paychecks, let me tell you that this is, a, this is not directly finance, but it's definitely good advice. First time I'm managing people and uh, my right hand guy, Carl, shows up and he says, hey, the paychecks are in, do you want me to hand them out? And I say, yeah, no worries, go ahead. Now keep in mind, they're all in sealed envelopes. And the other people that had my same job title in our business unit, they all gasped. I said, what? They said, you always hand out the paychecks. You always hand deliver them to the employees. Why do you think that's the right thing to do? Yeah, you want them to think of you as the person that delivers every good thing in their life. And what does that also mean? Yeah, you could take it away, right? You could take it away. Uh, my neighbors, I lived next door to some college kids when we were in doctoral school. And they said, hey, we're getting a puppy. I'm like, great. And they, I said, oh, wait a minute, what kind? They said, a pit bull. I'm like, mm -hmm. I went immediately and bought a box of dog biscuits. What do you think they did every day when I got home from class? Hey, killer. Killer and I were really good friends. Now, that's the same, kind of, I know people are a little more complicated than dogs, not much, but that's the same kind of thing you do, right? You're developing this relationship with them. Okay, so that's ADP. So far, uh, we are uh, zero for three. Then we have Oracle, what does Oracle do? Software, okay, what kind of software? Oracle to 
process any of our purchase orders or our finances. Okay, so database? Mm -hmm. Yeah, database is their big overriding thing. And they have morphed that database into the enterprise resource, resource planning. This is what you're talking about. And so Oracle's really big into that. In fact, Oracle is primarily software, but uh, they do actually, or at least they used to, have some hardware because back in the day they bought Sun Microsystems. And Sun Microsystems you probably recognize as the authors of Java, but they also had my, my first uh, computer-aided design terminal that I used in engineering school was made by Sun Microsystems. And so uh, we'll go ahead and give Oracle a pass here, but it's not pure software. Then there's computer sciences. I don't know what they do, so we'll skip them. Uh, computer associates, the next one, they buy licenses or they buy uh, the rights to uh, do the services on expired software stuff. So uh, when a, a software company goes bankrupt, Computer Associates will swoop in and buy that intellectual property, and then they will provide support for that software in exchange for money. So and actually, they're not, actuality, they're not writing software. What they are doing is supporting old software someone else wrote, and they're doing it for a fee. So I think maybe you could think of them as business service or consulting. So I'm gonna mark them off the list too. Fiserv writes software for banks. Do we have a company around here that does software for banks? You guys don't know this? This is one of the biggest uh, well-recognized companies around here. It's called Jack Henry. And if you talk to anybody in banking nationwide, they will recognize Jack Henry. And Jack Henry actually started in Monette, Missouri of all places. I think it's a population of 10,000. Uh, so they're, that's, that's what they do. And they're truly a software company. Fiserv does the same thing, but they also process credit card transactions. And so now we have the, yeah, they're software, but are they pure software? No, so we're gonna scratch them off the list. Then we have Accenture. Accenture uh, does business consulting. They install software for companies. And at first it might sound like they're a software company, but it's not software they wrote. And so it doesn't matter whether it's Oracle that you want or if it's SAP. You guys know about SAP? It doesn't matter. What are those things? Whatever you want, uh, basically Accenture will come and help you set up your business processes in order to be able to use the software that you want. And so it's more consulting than it is software. So we're going to cross them off the list too. Then we've got Symantec. What kind of software does Symantec do? No idea. If I said Norton, would that help? No idea. So this is, part of this is that um, nowadays your antivirus protection basically comes with Windows, right? So you guys don't have to worry about having a separate, separate antivirus package. But uh, we a lot of people still do have Symantec or Norton or McAfee, any of these antivirus packages. And those, I would say, yes, they are pure software, but they're not normal software. And here's why. If you're gonna update, if you're only gonna be able to afford to update one piece of software on your computer, what's it gonna be? Security. It's gonna be the security software. Uh, by the way, uh, Microsoft Office 2003, still works really well, right? I mean, the, the new stuff is a little better, but if I have that, I don't have to update it in order to be able to still be productive. But I certainly want to update that antivirus software because there are constantly new viruses, worms, and things coming out. And so that's why you see, even though that's a pure software company, it's got a low beta. The reason it's got a low beta is because people are gonna go ahead and buy that even when times are relatively bad. And then we have Paychex Inc. If you had to guess which company up here Paychex Inc. was very similar to, what would you guess? Yeah, it's very similar to ADP, so we're gonna scratch it off the list too. So out of all that, we found what? Two, maybe, that we could consider? 
And so what I'm telling you is it's very hard to find people who are doing exactly the thing that you want to do. And so this sounds like an appealing argument. However, it's really difficult to pull off. Questions? Okay, now let's talk about business cyclicality and beta. In any developed economy, you have what's called the business cycle. In the business cycle, you have times of growth, where are the, and we're measuring gross domestic product here. So that's our measure of the economy, GDP. So during uh, the business cycle, you're gonna have these times of growth, and then you're gonna have times of contraction. And then you're gonna have times of growth, and you're gonna have times of contraction. And what do we call these things? Recession. Yeah, this is a recession from peak to trough. From peak to trough is recession. We call this whole thing the business cycle. And we say that if a firm, if they have more sales as the economy is growing and less sales as the economy is shrinking, we call that business cyclical or pro-cyclical. You'll hear it both ways, cyclical or pro-cyclical. But we also have uh, stocks that are counter-cyclical. Can anybody give me an example of counter-cyclical? Something that would sell more in bad times. Um, during COVID, Dr. and Gable really did a lot of sales, as well as Zoom. Yep, okay, so and, and I, I wouldn't, this, so that's a very specific bad situation, right? Let's just talk about generally in a recession. Generally, yeah, Mr. Murs. Like ramen noodles? Yeah, ramen noodles. Nobody says, hey, wow, I just got a bonus at work. Let's have ramen noodles, right? And then what about um, cheap alcohol? Does anyone say, ooh, I just got a bonus at work. It's going to be Milwaukee's best tonight. Nobody says that. So those, those things are counter cyclical. And you can look at things like Walmart. When uh, the housing crisis hit, Walmart actually did better, right? Because we all thought we were going to be poor. And so uh, where do poor people buy their clothes? Walmart. And so everybody basically traded down. And so Walmart apparel would be counter cyclical. Does that make sense? And if you really are hurting, where do you go? Dollar General, Family Dollar. I actually bought some uh, dress pants to teach in in doctoral school. $7 a pair at Dollar General. That's how very little I was getting paid as a doctoral student. Goodwill. What's that? Goodwill. Goodwill. You know, I just feel skeezy wearing other people's clothes. But hey. If you don't, good for you, right? My mom's old friends are all very cheap, and they refer to Goodwill as GW Boutique, right? It makes them feel fancy for buying other people's clothes. Like, you can still smell the other person. But I digress. Back to the story. Okay, now, something to keep in mind, though, is that a business can be volatile without being cyclical. Let's talk about movie studios. Movie studios, their uh, earnings are volatile, but is it because they're going up and down with the economy? No. What's more likely the cause of their earnings going up and down? They're between movies. They're between movies, or they put out a really good one, cash flows are up, then they put out Paul Blart Mall Cop Part 7, and it's down. Do you see that? That's, so that's volatility, but it's not cyclicality. So cyclicality has, it's related to this idea of the systematic risk that we've talked about earlier. The things that are affecting most or all assets, the market risk. If it's, uh, if it's gonna be firm specific risk or asset specific risk, idiosyncratic risk, that's just this volatility. It's not cyclicality. And so if something is more sensitive to this business cycle, 
then it should have a higher beta. Something about this. If you've got something that uh, sells extraordinarily well in good times and doesn't sell much at all in bad times, let's say BMW, their beta is going to be higher than, say, Toyota. People buy a BMW to celebrate something. You're not celebrating good things, uh, good things in bad times. People buy a Toyota because they need a car, right? Does that make sense? So we're going to see companies, so, so BMW would be more cyclical, therefore it should have a higher beta. Questions so far? Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and draw out a big old diagram here to help you understand how these things are linked up. So we're going to say the economy is up, and we're going to follow two different trails here. And one of them is going to lead to an increase in sales at the company. We're assuming it's pro-cyclical. Now, this economy is also having an impact on the market. And remember that beta is all about the relationship between our company's returns and those of the market. And so this economy is hitting both of these things. And so what we're going to try to do here is come up with how is this related down to here. And so we know the first thing is that it's business cyclicality. So if your company is more cyclical, you're going to get a greater increase in sales given the same improvement in the economy, given the same improvement in the market. Are you with me so far? Mr. Breyer, you look slightly skeptical. No, I'm just still trying to think about it. Okay, so if it's the more cyclical it is, the greater the increase in sales for the same change in the economy. Okay, next we're going to talk about operating leverage, operating leverage. And, and so far, all we're really talking about here, uh, we can focus on, uh, uh, let's say, a product or a service. We're not talking about how that product or service gets delivered yet. We're just talking about, the, let's just call it a product. So everyone supplying uh, an identical product would be facing identical business cyclicality. So let's take Band-Aids, for example. If, uh, you know, the people that make Band-Aids and the people that make Curad, which I think is another one of the big players, they're facing exactly the same economic kind of business cyclicality, since I don't believe one or the other of those is a luxury compared to the other. Okay. so. For the same product, you're going to have that same business cyclicality. Your sales are going to uh, react to the change in the economy the same way. Now, there is something called operating leverage. And it's going to impact... Uh, leverage. Operating leverage is going to impact how that change in sales is translated into a change in profit. Operating leverage is about how a change in sales gets translated into profit. Okay, so here we have, and, and there are many different definitions of operating leverage. So you could have um, change in, uh, oh, here we've got EBIT. What does that stand for? Earnings before interest in taxes. We could also say change in operating cash flow. We could say change in net income. Any of those things, you could come up with some sort of operating leverage measure. But here's the basic idea. The top part is the change in profit. The bottom part is the change in sales. The top part is the change in profit. The bottom part is the change in sales. And the lowest operating leverage will ever be is one the lowest operating leverage will ever be is one. Let's talk about what impacts operating leverage. 
It's the mixture of fixed costs and variable costs at the company. It's the mixture of fixed costs and variable costs at the company. So think about someone who, um, in fact, have you guys ever seen the show, How It's Made? I love, there was this one and they were like, how oh, luxury Swiss watch bands are made. I'm like, well, that sounds cool. And it turned out it was this guy in his kitchen and he had pieces of leather and he had buckles and he had glue and he had just a, a small amount of tools and a big wooden block and he's sitting at his kitchen table. So the leather, is that a variable cost or a fixed cost? Variable. variable. The glue, variable cost or fixed cost? Variable. variable. In fact, everything that I just mentioned here, except for his very small amount of tools, would be variable cost. So let's, for sake of argument, say that um, he has zero fixed costs. His wife comes in and tells him, hey, we need 10% more money. So he says, well, that means I need 10% more profit at the company. What does that mean has to happen to his sales? Yeah, they've got to go up by 10%, right? So, so far, that's the easiest to think about. Now, let's think about this. We've got a company in China that also makes leather watch bands, and they also have variable costs. But instead of having a guy sitting at his table uh, making these things by hand, they have a huge machine. And that huge machine is sitting in a building. And what happens is they have uh, maybe three people working there. They've got two people at one end that are throwing the cowhides into the machine. And then the machine goes and shoots the watch bands out at the other end. And at the other end, there's one guy that's catching the watch bands in a big box, and it's his job to swash out, swap out the watch box, the watch band box. So now we've got three people, but they are making a boatload of watch bands. So let's think about this. Do they have the same leather, glue, string, buckles, variable costs? Absolutely they do. But what other costs do they have? Yeah, they got this huge fixed cost. They've got the machine, they've got the building. Now let's think about how this, uh, how this, how changes in sales would impact that company. If they were to have to double production, they're going to have to start a second shift. They're going to have doubled the variable costs and including labor, but that fixed cost will stay the same. Does that make sense? And so what does that mean? It means of these doublers that are coming in over and above the variable cost, that's pure profit. That makes sense. Okay, so basically, I can ramp up my production and I can double my sales, but my profit on those next 100% of watch bands that I build over and above what I was already doing, the profit on those bands is going to be greater because I've already paid off that fixed cost with the first. And so I can have a higher, I'll get a higher rate of profit. Now, we can also look at that going the other way. In fact, let me give you an example from the automotive industry that'll help make this a whole lot clearer. Um, so, two different auto manufacturers, Honda and General Motors. When you think of a Japanese car factory, do you think of people or robots? Robots, and that's exactly what I would have thought until I been, uh, visited the Honda plant in Liberty, Ohio. And I was amazed to see a swarm of humanity working on these cars. If you go visit a General Motors plant though, do you know what you'll see more of? Yeah, robots. And the question is, why? Any ideas? Yes, you're, you're, you're demonstrating both of our age. <laughs> yes, I believe the movie's called Gun Ho. Okay, 
So here's the idea. Um, we are constantly uh, sw uh, swapping out back and forth labor and capital. And of course, as a business, you want to keep your overall costs the pot as low as possible. Are you with me so far? And so if I could hire a bunch of people, do I need machines? If I could hire a bunch of people for cheap, do I need machines? Huh. But what if people are more expensive? Now machines start to make sense. Does that make sense? And so let's talk about the cost of labor at Honda versus at General Motors. Why would the labor be more expensive at General Motors? Any ideas? I'll give you a hint, it starts with a U. Yeah, they've got a union there. Those guys, you know, if you can't get your kids into med school, get them a job on the line at General Motors, right? Because they get paid well out of proportion to what they actually are knowing and doing. As opposed to Honda. Honda has no labor union. And so they don't have to pay as much, yet people still want to work there because they get treated well. So what does that mean? It means Honda uh, throws more people at these problems and General Motors throws more robots at them. Let's assume both Honda and GM are currently operating two shift operation. By the way, uh, in, in manufacturing, we have what are called shifts. You've got day shift, evening shift, and then the overnight shift, which I think may be called graveyard shift, depending on where you're at. But that's the idea. And if times are slow, you only run a day shift. And if business picks up, you run a day and an evening shift. That's a two shift operation. And if things are really going all out, then you run a three shift operation. That means 24 hours around the clock. Okay, now let's assume that both GM and Honda are currently operating a two shift operation. If uh, the, the orders go up by 50%, what are they gonna do? They're gonna add a third shift. Let's talk about what that looks like at Honda versus at General Motors. At Honda, we've got 5,000 people per shift. We've, our, we've got our first shift of 5,000, a second shift of 5,000. What have we got to do to make, what do we have to do to make a third shift possible? We got to go out and hire 5,000 people. Okay, so that's what's got to happen at Honda. Now let's talk about GM. GM, on the other hand, has a bunch of bunch of robots and they have 12 people per shift uh, required to go around and take care of these robots. And so if GM is going to uh, raise their production by 50%, how many people do they have to hire? 12. So do you see that an increase in sales would be much more profitable for GM than it would be for Honda? And it's based on this whole operating leverage. The reason that GM has this higher operating leverage is they've got all these fixed costs. As a result, they're not having to add as many laborers to make this thing happen. Now, so far, you're thinking, wow, oper high operating leverage is a pretty good deal. But what happens when times are bad and you've got to go from two shifts down to one shift? How many people does Honda get to cut loose when they go from two shifts down to one shift? 5,000 people, right? They have done a lot to cut their expenses. Over here at GM, we've gone from 24 people down to 12. We've cut 12 people loose. What does that do to our costs overall? Not much. And so what we're saying here is with high operating leverage, not only does a greater in, or the same increase in sale give you greater profit increase, a small decrease in sale gives you a greater profit decrease. So let's roll back to think about um, the last time that we had a big crash in automo automobile sales. It was uh, we had high gas prices. General Motors was primarily making SUVs, and uh, we know SUVs get really crappy gas mileage. And, uh, but, but before that, there had been a huge increase in 
the popularity of the SUVs. And so back then there weren't that many opportunities, options, so as Ford and GM and Jeep were making these things. And so their profits went way up because they increased in sales of SUVs and their high operating leverage, their profits went way up. Now Honda introduced some SUVs also, but their profits didn't go up by as much because they had lower operating leverage. Now let's think about what happened when gas prices go up and people don't want to buy SUVs anymore. Well, GM sales are down 10%, Honda sales are down 10%, but who's hurting worse? GM is hurting worse because what can Honda do? Honda can lay people off. GM's over here stuck with a bunch of robots. Can you say, robot XR42i, uh, you're no longer needed, take your oil can and go home? No, they're bolted to the floor. They're not going anywhere. That's fixed cost, right? And so that's why we see that companies with greater fixed costs have greater operating leverage. It's better for them in good times, worse for them in bad times. And so this operating leverage, here we're talking about uh, the, the market that we're playing in, the product, and here we're talking about how we're set up to do that. Okay, so between the two of these things, we can now talk about the risk of the underlying assets. Because it's the business that we're set up to take care of plus how we're set up to take care of it. So the assets at a company with higher operating leverage are going to be riskier than those at Honda or then those that they lower operating leverage. And so we're going to see that there's going to be a final kind of leverage we talk about, financial leverage, and then that's going to add the final layer to all of this. But before we do that, I want to make one more pass at this idea of labor versus capital. How many of you have heard people say, minimum of the, the minimum wage should be $15 an hour? Yeah, this, this is a common, and you'll see people picketing outside of fast food restaurants and whatnot. Now, if the fast food restaurant pays the help $15 an hour, what is that going to do to their overall costs? It's got to go up. Now, they may be limited on how much they can raise prices, and so what are they going to do? They're going to look for other ways to save money. And so now that the people are more expensive, I can turn to automation to try to blunt that increase in the cost. For example, they've opened a new Taco Bell just south of my house. And I went in there and there is not a counter where you can actually order from a person. It's all touch screen. Every single bit of it is touch screen. Why do you think that is? Yeah, they know you can run that thing on, in fact, I think they run it on two people, right? They don't have to have someone standing there at the counter. And it's great for me because they've got like six or seven of these kiosks. Whenever I walk in the Taco Bell, I always know what I want. And if, if it's like one of these where they got the counter, you have to stand in line for like 15 minutes and the person behind you or in front of you has been there the whole time and they get to the counter and they don't know what they want, and you just want to smack them around? Like, you've had 14 and a half minutes to figure this out. Anyway, but it's great. Now, it's not great for who? Oh, it's actually good for the business. Potential it's, employees. Yeah, the person that used to do this on the cash register, they're out of there now. Does that make sense? And so my, my point to you is, that these people who are pushing for these higher wages for workers like that are actually making automation more financially feasible. And what's that actually gonna do to the employment of people in that? Yeah, it's gonna go down, right? There's no magic bullet, there's no free money, right? These things are gonna trade off. Okay, now let's talk about, finally, Financial leverage. Crap. 
Oh, by the way, operating leverage magnifies business cyclicality. And so you can have a company or a business that's only mildly cyclical, and if you've got a high operating leverage, it's gonna magnify that. So you can think of operating leverage being a magnifying glass on business cyclicality. Now let's talk about financial leverage. What do we mean by financial leverage? What does this business have in its capital structure if we say it has leverage? Yes. They all have equity, but it has to have debt in order for us to say that it's got leverage. And so what we're talking about is uh, the proportion of debt that's in the capital structure. If you have an all equity firm, the beta of the equity is the same as the beta of the underlying assets. Let's call this money to shareholders. If we have an all equity firm, this money, and let's call this operating profit. Operating profit. This operating profit, after we pay our taxes, all that money goes to the shareholder. But what if instead we have debt? What else do we have to pay? Interest. Yeah, uh, interest, right? So that's going to go to the bondholders. And so we see that there is this financial leverage. If, uh, if we have financial leverage, and it's going to be the equity multiplier, it's going to be our measurement here. If that equity multiplier is one, then the money to the shareholder is, uh, is the same as its operating profit. Actually, I'm going to change this. Uh, let's call it it's something similar to ROE. Something similar to ROE. So let's say return to stockholders. There we go. That's what we need to say. Return to stockholders. And so if our equity multiplier is one, we've got no leverage at all then the, all this profit is going to be returned to the shareholders. Okay, now, what if we have debt in here? Now, we are actually magnifying the equity using the, uh, using the equity multiplier. In fact, do you remember this? Chapter three, the return on equity is equal to the return on the assets times the equity multiplier. And so this whole thing, we're talking basically about ROA, and this whole thing, we're talking about ROE. And so actually by having more debt in the capital structure, our equity multiplier is higher, and that's gonna make ROE climb away from ROA. And so once again, this acts as, and I'm gonna draw a magnifying glass here, acts as a magnifier. And so if you want to have the firm with the highest possible beta, what would it look like? It would have high business cyclicality. It would sell really well in great times and sell really badly in poor times. Number two, it would have high operating leverage it would have a huge proportion of fixed costs in its cost structure. And number three, it would be highly financially levered, meaning it would have a lot of debt in its capital structure. And you notice I said return here to shareholders. What we're talking about is uh, based on their initial investment. So think about two firms. If I've got one firm, and they're both worth $100 million. I've got one firm that's entirely equity financed. How many million dollars worth of equity does it have? It has to have 100 million, right? And so any money that we get out of that is going to be divided by that 100 million. That's an equity multiplier of one. 
But what if instead I go out and borrow 80% of the money? Now I've got 20 million in equity and 80 million in debt. Are you with me so far? Okay, now looking at that in terms of return on equity, instead of dividing by 100 like we were over here with the all equity company, what are we now dividing by to get that return number? just 20, right? So that's how this equity multiplier manages to boost the return of shareholders based on the same profits, the same operating profit. Okay, now if I take all of this together then, I'm talking about the risk of the stock. That's the risk of the stock. It's the business cyclicality uh, magnified by the operating leverage, magnified by the equity multiplier tells us about the risk of the stock. Now remember when we also when we started out on this, we we're talking about the returns on the market versus the returns on the stock. That is beta. So this is how these things are related. How is this related to, to this number over here? It's beta. So you can see why all these things go into determining beta. The business cycle, the operating leverage, and the equity multiplier. Throw all that in there and that's how you come up with the beta of the equity. Now you may also hear people talk about the beta of the assets. That's gonna be this part right here. And then we'd be talking about what's going on here versus the market. That's the beta of the assets. And then an all equity firm would be exactly the same as the beta of the stock because the equity multiplier would be one. Now, let's talk about beta of the assets and all that. So uh, this beta of the asset part is gonna be equal to the weighted average of the beta of the equity and the beta of the debt. And what are the weights here? What do you think the E stands for? Equity. What do you think the D stands for? Debt. And D plus E would be equal to the total assets of the firm. And so what we're basically looking at with these weights is the proportion of the capital structure that is equity multiplied by the beta of the equity plus the proportion of the capital structure that is debt multiplied by the beta of the debt. Now, do you think this formula should be on your note sheet? Absolutely. This formula should be on your note sheet. And we could solve for any one of these things. We could solve for any one of these things. And so that might be something that I would ask you to do. But a common assumption is, unless you're told otherwise, is that beta of debt is equal to zero. And let's talk about why the beta of debt might be equal to zero. Let's look at how um, stocks pay out versus how bonds pay out. If times are really good, the company pays out a dividend. Uh, times are, they might cut the dividend. Times are awful, they might do a, delete the dividend entirely. And so the, the cash flows that you get out of stocks are going to go along with the market and go along with the economy. So they all tend to go together. But let's talk about the uh, payouts on debt. Times are really good. Here's your coupon. Times are eh. Here's your coupon. Times are bad. Here's your coupon. Times are really bad. Unless we're going bankrupt. Here's your coupon. Do you see that these payments that you get out of debt are far less related to what's going on in the overall economy, right? They're a whole lot, they're fixed payments instead of the flexibility that you have with equity. And so a lot of times we will make the assumption that the beta of debt is equal to zero. Now, if I tell you the beta of debt is equal to one half, should you assume it's zero? No. You go back to that other equation. But if I don't tell you a beta of debt, you can assume that it's zero and then something magical happens. 
we can actually get rid of that second term because anything times zero is zero. Does that make sense? And so now we have this beta of the asset is equal to equity divided by assets times the beta of the equity. And then we can rearrange that formula to solve for beta of the equity. And we see that the beta of the uh, asset, or the beta of equity is actually the assets divided by equity multiplied by the beta of the assets. We actually have the name of that, assets over equity. What do you call that in chapter three? equity multiplier, isn't it? That's the equity multiplier. And we know that's also one plus total debt over total equity. And so what we're really saying here is that the beta of the equity is equal to the beta of the assets multiplied by the equity multiplier. That's exactly what we were saying back here. It's this thing, this equity multiplier acts as a magnifier on the risk of those assets to come up with the risk of the equity. So what does that mean for the risk of a stock with a company that's got a whole lot of debt? Remember we talked earlier, because we also know that ROE is equal to ROA times the equity multiplier. Those look a whole lot alike. What's the difference? This is risk. This is return. What do we say about risk and return? They go together. And so you might be tempted to jack up your equity multiplier because you're going to give yourself this great big old ROE. But guess what? You've given yourself the risk that goes along with it. Does that make sense? So that brings us to the end of our discussion of the uh, security market line. The other way that we're going to uh, estimate our cost of equity is through the dividend discount model, which remember uh, required return is equal to the dividend yield plus the capital gains yield, which is D1 over P0 plus G. And we talked about the two ways to estimate G. One is the historical growth rate of the dividends. The other would be uh, plot back ratio times ROE. Now, that's a whole lot easier than what we just went through, uh, but it doesn't work for most firms because most firms don't have constantly growing dividends. And in fact, if we look at how dividends actually grow at firms, if we look at how dividends actually grow at firms, they tend to grow like this. Stay the same for a while, then they go up. They stay the same for a while, then they go up. They stay the same for a while, then they go up. And it looks like that. And in fact, we say that dividends are sticky. Why are dividends sticky? Managers know that the market will punish them more for cutting a dividend than it will reward them for raising a dividend. There's an asymmetric response. You could raise dividends by 10%, every root pat you on the back, your stock goes up a little bit. You cut dividends by 10%, everyone kicks you in the butt and your stock goes down by 20%. And so what does that mean? It means that managers will be reluctant to raise dividends until they know they can continue to support that rate of higher dividends. And so what they do is they First they raise the dividend and then they sit and they wait and they make sure that everything's gonna be good and that they can continue to pay that higher dividend before they ever raise the dividend. And so they're darn good and sure they're gonna be able to keep this up unless something really strange happens. Now, what does that mean for you? There are no truly constantly growing dividend firms out there, but what can we do? we could approximate this as constant dividend growth. 
So even if a firm doesn't have constantly growing dividends, if we can do something like this, then we can figure out that growth rate and we can use this dividend discount model. Now for you on an exam, how are you going to know which of these to do? It's basically like cooking. When I look into the cabinet and I see the ingredients for I've got pasta, I've got a prego marinara, and I've got uh, some uh, Parmesan cheese, you know I'm gonna have something Italian, right? Look at the ingredients, tells us what to cook. If I give you the risk-free rate, beta, and the expected return on the market, are you using security market line or are you using this? Security. Yeah, using security market line. On the other hand, if I give you a dividend, the share price, and a growth rate, you're gonna use this. What if I give you both? Do both. Do both, and then do what? Oh, you're, you're getting there. Uh, um, do both, and then what should I do with those two numbers? Let's say it's 9% and 11%. Average. Yeah, add them together, divide by two. Average, right? Remember, all these things are just scientific, wild-ass guesses, right? And so we can just add those together, divide by two, come up with the average, and that would be what I would use in the problem. Questions? Okay, now the cost of debt is a whole lot easier. You guys are all masters of figuring out the yield and maturity on debt by now because you just finished an exam on chapter five. And so I'm gonna tell you that all we're going to do is figure out what is the weighted average yield to maturity for all the bond issues at the firm. The weighted average yield maturity on all the bond issues at the firm. And we're gonna use that as our required return on debt. And remind me at the next class, and I will work out an example on the board of how to find the weighted average yield of maturity on all the bond issues at the company. Are there any questions? Okay, I'll see you guys next time.